So let's do Revlon. Revlon. So we know Revlon is a um, cosmetics company. Um, and uh, in this case, they are being approached by um, uh, a, uh, a small, relatively small, it's kind of like a 7-Eleven. Um, the, um, uh, the company is called Pantry Pride. They are actually like a low version of, of 7-Eleven. I don't think they exist anymore. They were primarily in kind of Florida uh, and the middle of the uh, east coast of the United States and you could go and buy small bread and things like that. So you have kind of 7-Eleven trying to acquire Revlon. Okay, so it's a very, very different culture and you see that reflected in this case. Um, so up to this point we've looked at Unical where the board is acting as a defender and the directors consistent with their fiduciary obligations are keeping the acquirer away because of a threat. A threat to the policies, the effectiveness of the company, or a threat to the shareholders. And so they put into place defensive measures like the poison pill and the staggered board uh, in order to perhaps force the, uh, the acquirer to increase the price, to get enough shareholders to support the price, to vote out the board of directors, or just to simply negotiate with the board of directors and to find a higher price. So it's the defensive measure. In Revlon, we look at a sale of control where the board of directors has decided they're going to sell control of the company. Either the company will be broken up, perhaps, uh, or they are actually selling control. The company is owned by the public shareholders and perhaps they are selling it for cash or something other than simply stock of the acquirer uh, to uh, what will be a new parent company, perhaps someone who merges. Uh, and in that case, the company moves from being a defender, the board moves from being a defender to an auctioneer. They're looking to maximize shareholder value uh, in the short term. Um, uh, and it happens when the board recognizes uh, that the target company is in play. In play. By in play it means they are going to be taken over. They are uh, available to be taken over. Uh, we're not sure who's going to acquire them. Uh, we're not sure who, who's going to win. Uh, but the idea is, is that the board of directors is obligated now not just to defend, right? Defense is over because now they've given up. They know that the company will be acquired, right? The company is going to be bought by somebody. Um, now they're looking to maximize value in the short term. Um, and so like in Unical and Unitrin, uh, actually using many of the same principles uh, as in the Unical case, we're going to assess the board's conduct in trying to maximize value when there's a sale of control of the company or when the company is potentially going to be broken up. Okay, so we start with the facts. We're dealing with Pantry Pride and Pantry Pride is owned by Ron Perlman. Ron Perlman, a very well-known, still today, very well-known uh, 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 acquirer. Uh, can, he can be quite hostile. Uh, and um, he's going to try to, through using Pantry Pride, uh, acquire Revlon. Um, the uh, Revlon board turns to Mr. Forstman. Remember, we talked about a white knight. Mr. Forstman is a white knight. They are turning to him and saying, protect us from this evil Mr. Uh, Perlman um, and, uh, and using his firm uh, to block uh, the acquisition by Pantry Pride. Now just so you know, I know you guys read these cases and you think, oh it's so dry. You know, I, just to let you know how colorful it can be. So how many of you watch Hollywood type movies? Not good Hollywood movies. So there's an actress named Ellen Barkin some of you may know, you can look her up. Ellen Barkin was married to Ron Perlman for a while. Uh, uh, as I understand it, they had a very messy divorce. Uh, he had given her a lot of jewelry and she ended up auctioning it off to uh, kind of to, uh, to spite, I think, her husband, uh, her ex-husband. Uh, Ted Forsman, uh, I may have mentioned this, dated uh, a very uh, attractive TV host and model, Padma Lakshmi. Uh, Ted Forsman, unfortunately, passed away. Uh, but if you uh, find pictures of him on the internet, you'll see he looks like a statesman. Ron Perlman looks really tough. He, he's a uh, bald, shaved head, big guy, smokes a cigar, 
Take a look at Ted Forsman. He's a little bit more elderly statesman-like, uh, sort of guy that maybe Padma Lakshmi would go out for dates with. Um, okay, so there's this bidding war between Pantry Pride on the one hand and Ted Forsman on the other uh, for uh, taking control, acquiring Revlon. Um, and the outcome is uncertain. Right? It's inevitable that Revlon will be acquired because the price has gotten so high that it's going to be hard for the board to justify that this is a threat. Right? We can't say that the price is low, that it's somehow undervaluing the company. The price has gotten so high, it's just not clear who's going to be uh, the winner. Okay, so in June 1985, uh, Mr. Perlman approaches Michelle Bergerac, who is the CEO of Revlon, uh, about doing a friendly acquisition. Right? So Pantry Pride will acquire Revlon in a friendly deal for something between $40 and $50 a share. Uh, and Mr. Bergerac says no. Does he say no because of the price? Well, maybe. But what else? This is on page 1292. What else does Mr. Bergerac say? Or what, what, else, what else does the court say? They did not like each other. Right? They did not like each other. So notice, personality really does play a role uh, in, um, in how boards and senior managers react. Um, okay, so Mr. Bergerac says, uh, I don't want to do business with you. Uh, the two CEOs don't get along. Um, he does say that if we're going to continue to talk, I want you, Mr. Perlman, to sign what? A standstill agreement. Right, we had talked about standstill agreements. Right, if I'm going to negotiate with you, I want to make sure you're not out buying my stock using whatever information I give you in a way that is potentially adverse to me. Right, so if we're going, before we get married, I want to agree that we're dating, uh, that you're going to stand still, not acquire my stock, that we're going to actually negotiate together uh, and maybe at some future date enter into a deal. So really, it's a defense. It's a defense in this case. Right? I know you're a hostile guy. If you want to negotiate with me, if you're really sincere about talking to me about the deal, sign a standstill, agree that for some period of time you will not buy my stock, so that I know since you are known for being hostile, you're not going to take over the company. So it actually has a little bit of a defensive aspect to it. Um, Mr. Perlman says no, he's not going to sign the standstill. Uh, August rolls around and the uh, Pantry Pride Board authorizes Mr. Perlman to acquire Revlon in a friendly deal uh, for $42 or $43 or in a hostile deal for up to $45. Um, okay, August 19th. There is a meeting of the Revlon Board uh, and the Revlon Financial Advisor is there with the Board and they advise the board $45 is grossly inadequate. And Lazard advises the Revlon board that if Mr. Perlman goes forward with the deal, Pantry Pride is very likely to bust up Revlon. Right? So it's going to acquire the company and chop it up and sell off the pieces. Uh, and the result will be something equal to somewhere between $60 and $70 a share. Um, if Revlon were to be sold in its entirety as a whole company, the per share price is likely to be somewhere in the mid-50s. So keep in mind, right, the price in this stage is maybe in the low 40s, right, it's below $45, $43, right, it's below that. That's why uh, Mr. Perlman is offering that price. And yet Lazard is saying that if they sold the company today, it, they could sell it for something in the mid-50s, $55. And if Mr. Perlman broke the company up, you could actually sell the pieces for the equivalent of $60 or $70. Stop. Doesn't this sound strange? Right? This very significant disparity in price between the price that the stock is actually trading at and the value that the company could be, uh, would have if you sold the company outright or broke it up into its pieces. What it suggests is perhaps the stock markets aren't accurately assessing the value here. Maybe, right? We've talked about though, some of these reasons, some of the reasons why you might see disparities. So why, why is the stock price so low? What are some of the reasons we've wrestled with? Why could the price be lower than the price at which Mr. Perlman would be prepared to pay for the company or the price at which the company could be sold in pieces? Why is the price so low? Well, a control premium, okay, so 
you might argue that if I sell the control uh, the company in its entirety, right, uh, as opposed to the minority share discount, because I've sold it in its entirety, I'm selling control. So that might account for some of the difference. What else? Concealed information. Who has concealed information? The corporation has some information that is not known by much. Ah, okay. So maybe Revlon is a complicated company, difficult to understand. Maybe there's information the company doesn't know about. What case? What's our favorite case? Van Gorkum. Yeah, remember Van Gorkum, same point, right? TransUnion, very complex, not able to be understood by the markets. That's why the board thought that the TransUnion price was perhaps undervalued. Same thing could apply here. What else? What else? I'm oh, sorry? Bad management. Maybe the managers aren't as good as they could be. If Mr. Perlman stepped in and bought the company, he would put in better managers perhaps. If a new acquirer stepped in, they would run the assets, run the company better. That would increase the price. What's one more thing we've looked at? One last reason why the price might be a little higher to somebody else. We use the term synergies, synergy, right? That perhaps the acquirer would have some special value associated with this business, right? And so it would be willing to pay a little bit more to reflect the special value that would happen if the Revlon business or particular assets or particular parts of Revlon were combined with their business. And because of that, they're prepared to share some of this value uh, with the seller. Right, so these are all reasons, potentially, inefficiencies, synergies, uh, control premium, uh, managers not being efficient. All of these things, perhaps, we don't know from the case, but they would argue for why you're going to see this disparity. Right? Why you're going to see the stock price in the market trading at the low 40s, but in fact the price at which the company could be sold in total being somewhere in the $55 range, and again, if the company was broken up, somewhere in excess of $60. Um, okay, so the board now is dealing with Mr. Perlman. Pantry Pride has made an offer. The board doesn't like this offer. They think it's too low. What's the standard of review? How do we assess the board's conduct? Oh, Unical. Yeah, geez, we're just back. It's Unical again. Today is Unical all day long. Okay, the Unical standard, right? Unical standard, intermediate business judgment. Okay, um, so what does the board, first of all, who has the burden? The board of directors, right? You want to really think about this as shifting burdens of proof. It's very important who has the presumption in their favor and who has the burden to affirmatively demonstrate compliance with a particular standard. So in this case, the burden of proof is with the board of directors. And what do they have to prove first? Okay, that they are, this is a process, right? That they are in good faith conducting a reasonable investigation. Right, and re so they're really, they're satisfying their duty of care. Right, in good faith they are making the appropriate inquiries, like we saw in Van Gorkum, they're asking all the right questions in order to assess whether or not there's a threat. Uh, and the threat is whether or not the offer, uh, or in this case the acquirer, poses a threat to the corporate policy, the effectiveness of the company, uh, a danger to the corporate policy, the effectiveness of the company, or a danger, uh, a coerciveness perhaps, uh, to the shareholders. Um, in this case, what do we always look at first? in deciding the sort of uh, uh, deference, perhaps, that the court might have to the board of directors in satisfying this first step in the Unical standard. What do we ask? Board of directors is a majority of what? Independent, independent or not, right? Again, it's not dispositive, but we want to know whether or not a majority is independent, right? Because the idea here is that the court is assessing the process by which the board reached these decisions. And if you have a majority of independent directors, there is a greater likelihood, again, it's not dispositive, but a greater comfort that what they're doing, because they are independent, is more neutral. That the conflicts that are potentially here 
are not as significant. Um, okay, does the uh, does the, uh, the 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 favor of a majority of independent directors does this um, does the benefit uh, does it does it apply to the Revlon board? Does Revlon get this benefit? No. Where are we looking? Yeah, but where are we looking in the in the case? Footnote three. Read the footnotes. By the way, law professors, most of our questions, they're in the footnotes, right? Okay, the footnotes are there for, so the footnote, footnote three, right, page 1292, says, look, the board, uh, the court is unable to conclude in this case that a majority of the board is independent, either because they are insiders or because they have significant business relationships or prior relationships with the company. So they're not going to give the same uh, inclination, the same benefit of the doubt to the board of directors that you might otherwise apply that we saw in the, the Moran case uh, based upon a majority being independent. Um, okay, does that mean though that they are dead? No, it's just simply something the court considers in deciding whether or not they should get uh, the benefit of the doubt in assessing their compliance with the UNICAL standard. In this case, the board looks like they conducted a real review. Right? They spent a lot of time looking at the nature of the threat. Um, they have the advice of advisors. Uh, they spend a lot of time on their own analysis. Uh, and the board appears to have done more than what was sufficient uh, in order to assess the nature of the threat. So we've got Mr. Perlman, who is a known bust-up acquirer he liquidates companies. He's sort of like Mr. Boone Pickens in the Unical case. Uh, and so reasonably, considering the nature of the acquirer, the board can consider whether or not that constitutes a threat to the company, uh, the impact on Revlon's continued business. Um, they also take a look at um, uh, what the Unitrin case refers to as Substantive coercion. Unitrin was decided after Revlon, uh, but it's still something they're, they're taking a look at. They don't call it substantive coercion, but it's the same idea that we looked at in the Unitrin case. And remember, substantive coercion was the uh, idea that shareholders might not have enough information on their own to properly assess value, kind of like what we saw in air gas. And so as a result, they might be misled by the acquirer to accept an offer that's below the real value of the company. Right? So Unitrin called it substantive coercion. Revlon is talking about the actual value uh, of the company based upon information the shareholders either don't have or perhaps may not fully accept or understand uh, the company being valued at a price higher than the, the acquirer uh, is offering and the shareholder is not uh, necessarily uh, believing managers' statements about the intrinsic value uh, of the Revlon business. Um, what else are they looking at? They're also looking at whether or not there's a control premium. Right, our discussion from a few moments ago. Like in Van Gorkum, right, whether or not there's a control premium because after all Mr. Perlman is trying to take control of the entire company. So it's not just simply offering a price above the market price but whether or not the market, the price that he's offering reflects a control premium uh, because he's trying to acquire uh, the, uh, the entire company. Okay, so all these things the board considers with the assistance of outside advisors uh, and the court finds nothing wrong. Right? They don't get the presumption in their favor uh, because a majority of the directors are not viewed as independent, but nonetheless uh, the court says they've acted in good faith, reasonably, to identify the threat, and it seems to be sufficient. Right? They're comfortable that yes, there really is a threat there. Okay, are we done with Unical? What happens after you've assessed the threat? By the way, Tonight at 2 in the morning, half of you will wake up dreaming about Unical. <laughs> okay? So what happens after you've, after you've assessed the threat? What do you look at? I'm sorry? The nature of the response. And the response cannot be draconian, right? Meaning it cannot be coercive or preclusive. Okay, right? So they look first at the nature of the response. Cannot be draconian means it cannot be preclusive or coercive. 
uh, and it's going to have to be reasonable in relation to the threat posed, assuming it's not uh, a, a range of reasonableness, assuming it's not coercive, it's not preclusive, it has to be a, within a range of reasonableness, right? It's going to be assessed relative to the nature of the threat. Big threat, big response, smaller threat, smaller response. So what is the response here? Marty Lipton, right, very, very famous takeover lawyer, very often represents, typically, I think almost, in almost all cases, represents the target company. Um, he makes two recommendations. So what does he suggest the company should do? Okay, so buy up some of your outstanding shares. Right? He initially says the company should buy back 5 million of its shares. Later on, they decide 10 million. Right of the outstanding 30 million shares, and the second is what? Right. I'm sorry. A kind of poison pill, right? It's the note purchase rights plan, um, and it says that each right entitles the holder to receive one share for a note with $65 in principal amount with a 12% coupon maturing in one year, right? And so it becomes effective whenever someone acquires more than 20% of Revlon unless the acquirer agrees to buy out everyone at $65. So it's setting a minimum price. It's saying if you agree to buy everyone out at $65, then you never have to worry about the pill being exercised. Otherwise, you have to face uh, this uh, note purchase right agreement where all the investors uh, will be able to exchange one share for this uh, note uh, with a value of $65. Um, the rights are not exercisable by the acquirer, so like our normal poison pill, the acquirer who triggers the pill doesn't get the benefit of exchanging its shares for these notes, uh, and it's redeemable by the board if it's not exercised for $0.10 cents per right. All right. So again, it's our standard pill, but instead of uh, issuing stock, that dilutes down the acquirer, it's going to be issuing debt, again, to anyone not the acquirer, uh, equal to $65, assuming the acquirer isn't offering a price to all the shareholders equal to $65 a share. Um, so what's the impact of these strategies? So what's for the, the repurchase? Buying back 5 million shares, 10 million shares. Why is that a defense? Because it will issue a lot of well, this is the buyback. This is the buyback. So the note, so it's two things, right? So number one, buyback stock. And number two, the rights plan. So the first one, the buyback of the stock. It's not necessarily, it's not for debt. First of all, they need to use the file of the company. Okay. Uh, and second, I think, uh, then, then they will get more uh, volume right. No, once the company has the shares, there are no voting rights, right? So they're not going to get votes. But, but yes. Sorry. But they have shares. Yeah, but typically, once the company takes treasury stock, the rights expire. The voting rights expire, right? So they'll buy it back in, uh, and they won't get the benefit. Um, otherwise, a great takeover defense would be to issue stock to yourself. Right, same reason. Right, you can't, the treasury stock is not going to be counted towards the votes. But you're right. You're going to use up a lot of extra cash. Right, I'm going to have I, cash that otherwise is there for research and development, for other valuable projects is being sucked up. In fact, the company might have to borrow even to be able to pay the price for 10 million shares. Uh, so it's going to increase its leverage. Remember, we saw this in Unical. Right, it's a defense. We're making the company less attractive. It's kind of a funny defense, right? Because we're making ourselves less attractive in order to keep the acquirer away. Uh, perhaps in this case by benefiting some of the shareholders. What do you think is going to be happen when the company buys back the stock? No, they're not going to. Just in terms of the buyback, don't let's don't assume they're going to reissue it. Can they? Could they reissue it? Let's assume they bought back 20% of the company and then simply gave it to their good friend, Mr. Whitehead. Can they do this? I know Edison knows the answer to this because he, he loves this case. Can we do this? So Whitehead, well, so, so uh, Revlon buys back 20% of the company. Uh, not enough to take control, but maybe enough to block Mr. Perlman. 
and they take the stock and they give it to their good friend, Mr. Whitehead. Can you do this? This is the case Edison hates because he never, he never gets the name right. That's why. What case, what case says you can't do this? It raises a Blasius issue, right? Because we are selling the stock to Mr. Whitehead not to raise capital, but to actually block the voting rights of Mr. Perlman in this case. Do you remember which case we saw that did this? Very short note. Lunkenheimer. Lunkenheimer, right? That was the US industry's stock swap, right? Same problem. So we can't do that. But what's going to happen as we're buying back the stock? What's going to happen to the stock price? The price of the stock is going to increase. Yeah, the price is going to go up. OK, so I'm going to make it more expensive for Mr. Perlman to buy this stock. That's a defense. I'm going to suck up extra cash that would otherwise be available for valuable projects to pay to the shareholders. That's a defense. And I might increase leverage, like we saw in Unical, right? Make the company less attractive. OK, so that's the purpose of the repurchase. What about the rights plan? That's much easier. What happens with the rights? If the rights get exercised, what's the effect? I'm sorry? There's a lot more debt, right? So we're going to leverage up the company again, like we saw in Unical. And if there's more debt, it means that the equity, there's going to be less available cash in the company for development, research, other valuable projects. The company perhaps is a little closer to bankruptcy. It may be a little less stable, right? A lot of debt, a lot of burden on the company. So again, the impact, uh, so remember the rights plan, the debt rights plan gets triggered uh, if Mr. Perlman ends up buying uh, a lot of stock, enough to trigger 20% of Revlon. Uh, at a time he owns 20% of the company, if he's not tendering at a price of $65, the rights get, ish get exercised, the new notes, the leverage, the increased debt gets burdened on the company. It means the price that he paid for that 20% is much too high. The stock price isn't worth nearly that. And yet he's triggered by buying 20%. He's triggered the notes, made the company less attractive. So it's a, again, it's a defense. It's an odd defense. Right, the company is messing with its own capital structure to make itself look attra less attractive to equity holders. Um, but it's also a very expensive thing for Mr. Perlman because at a time when he owns 20% of the company, the value of his stock drops dramatically. Particularly because up to that point, he has been buying, if the repurchase has the effect of increasing the price, at higher and higher prices for the Revlon shares. OK, the board approves both proposals unanimously. Um, Good advice? Was this good advice? Did Mr. Lipton give good advice to uh, the Revlon board? Yes. Yeah, seems to be, right? Uh, in this case, the rights plan uh, protects the shareholders from being coerced. Ultimately, the Revlon price, uh, the, the, the Pantry Pride bid, rises to something like $58 a share, right? So it's doing exactly Right, what these defensive mechanisms are supposed to do. Remember, the idea isn't to preclude the takeover. It's to force the acquirer to increase the price, perhaps negotiate with the board. And that's exactly what happens in this case. Right, so it seems to be a pretty reasonable response, given the nature of the threat. And the outcome certainly makes it sound like it was good advice. Um, OK, August 23rd rolls around. Uh, Pantry Pride makes an all-cash tender offer at $47.50 a share with two conditions. Right? It says first, uh, it has to get the financing. Uh, and secondly, uh, the rights have to be redeemed, rescinded, or avoided. Right? So I'm making the tender offer. I don't actually own the stock, so the rights get exercised upon ownership of 20%, not the tender offer. So I'll make the tender offer, but I will only buy your stock if the rights are redeemed, canceled by the board of directors. Um, at the same time, uh, or shortly thereafter, three days later, the board of directors of Revlon meets. This is on August 26. They reject the pantry pride offer. Again, it's too low. Doesn't reflect what they believe the value of the company to be. Uh, and they commence their own self-tender. And they tender for 10 million shares of the company. So they're tendering for up to, so they're basically buying back up to 10 million shares, uh, with one share being exchangeable for $47.50 in debt, plus one-tenth of a share of preferred stock, 
uh, the stock is uh, valued at $100, so it's a tenth of that, so it's $10. So it's $47.50 in debt, plus one-tenth of preferred stock, equal to about $10. So the total amount that Revlon is offering is $57.50, but not in cash. It's a combination of debt and preferred stock. Uh, and it's offering to buy back 10 million shares. Uh, and Lazard believes that the notes will trade at par. It means they will trade at their face value. So I'm selling you the notes with a face value of 47.50, and the notes will trade in the market. You'll be able to sell the notes and get $47.50 in cash. Uh, so you get roughly uh, 33 million shares tendered. Revlon accepts 10 million of them on a pro rata basis. Um, and it issues $475 million in debt. Um, and using the Unical standard, the court takes a look at um, uh, the, uh, the nature of the response. They find, they find the initial uh, offer by uh, uh, Pantry Pride as being grossly inadequate. Uh, at least the board's conclusion was sufficient to support it being inadequate. They had acted good faith and reasonably. Uh, the process had, had been appropriate. Uh, to verify the nature of the threat. The threat in this case being a price that was too low that shareholders might not fully appreciate and the response is proportionate as well. Uh, the plan, the court concludes, is not viewed as preclusive. Uh, given the high nature of the threat, it's within a range of reasonableness. Uh, and again, it seems to work. Ultimately, by keeping pantry pride away, the price that they eventually end up offering is substantially in excess of this initial bid. It goes up to $58 a share. It's accomplishing what it is we hope these sorts of defenses will do. Um, these notes that are issued have an unusual feature. So we know that they're, one of the reasons they're issued uh, is in order to, again, increase the leverage in the company, make the company less attractive. So there's a defensive aspect in this case. They actually incur debt, they issue debt in this instance, uh, as well as preferred stock, in order to make the company less attractive. Um, but they have an unusual feature. What's unusual about this debt? I'm sorry? Limited Reversibility. What do you mean by that? Okay. So the debt includes protections for the note holders. Right. We talked about this in our very, very first class. Right. So in terms of protecting shareholders, right, because of the nature of their risk, uh, because of their stature within the capital structure of the company, they get voting rights, they get the benefit of fiduciary duties. Does, get, does debt have a fiduciary, does debt get the benefit of fiduciary duties? No. So they rely upon contractual protections called covenants, right? Covenants. So the notes in this case have covenants. And the covenants are there to protect the note holders. And they say, look, we will go ahead and protect the note holders. No, the debt is not senior debt. It's senior subordinated debt. So it's not the highest level of debt. It's right below the highest level. right? It's probably junior to bank debt. Bank debt is typically senior debt. So they say, look, we're going to protect the debt. We're going to limit the ability of the company to issue additional debt. So we're not going to leverage the company. We're going to stop dividends from being paid. Any cash that is in the company, we don't want it to go to the shareholders. It should go to the debt holders. And we're going to limit your ability, the company, to sell assets. Right? If you sell assets, we want the, uh, if you sell assets, we're going to want the cash to go to the note holders again. So these covenants restrict the ability of the company to do dividends, to borrow money, senior to uh, borrow any indebtedness, particularly senior indebtedness, and also to sell assets. And it's there to protect the note holders. But, as you say, they can be reversed. Who can reverse, who can reverse these covenants? What's unusual about this? Who, can, who makes the decision to waive these covenants, get rid of these covenants? The board of directors. Now stop for a moment. We've got covenants in the notes that are there to protect the note holders. Right? And they are there to protect the note holders against 
things the board might do that could benefit the shareholders. Right? Dividends would benefit the shareholders. Uh, the equity would benefit if assets were sold and they received the dividends. Right? These are all things that are there to protect the debt holders. And yet these covenants can be waived, can be reversed by the board of directors. Who does the board of directors owe a duty to? So when they decide to waive the covenants that are there to protect the note holders, are they thinking about what's in the note holders' interests? No, their obligation is to think about what maximizes value for the shareholders. It is quite an unusual feature. Right? At most, the board of directors must act in good faith, consistent with the terms of the notes, the contract, but their fiduciary obligations run to the equity. So in this case, um, the board's duties to the shareholders mean that when they decide to waive these covenants, they will not do it thinking about the note holders' interests. They will be obligated, consistent with their fiduciary obligations, to think about what's in the interests of the shareholders. Um, okay, so you're a lawyer for the note holders. And you, you happen to have sat through Whitehead's lectures. You've survived. And you know provisions like this are unusual. Could you draft a provision in the notes that says the board, when they waive these covenants, will think about what's in the best interest of the note holders? Can we just fix it that way? So we, we know that the board of directors, if we're silent in the notes, is going to think about what's benefiting the shareholders in deciding whether to waive these protections, protections for the note holders. You know that's a problem, so you've decided to draft the contract. You're going to put in the notes a provision that says the board of directors, in exercising its discretion to waive these provisions, will do so in consideration of the best interest of the note holders. We'll fix it that way. And if so, if they, if they decide some other way, it breaches the contract. Can we do that? No? Why not? It's a contract. Oh, what case? Charlestown boot. Yes, right? It's our Charlestown boot case again, right? Through contract, right? It's like our dead hand pill. You cannot contractually restrict the board's exercise of its fiduciary duties, which is what you would be trying to do in this case, right? Through the notes. You would try to limit the board's exercise of its duties for the benefit of its shareholders, in this case, directing them towards the note holders. Um, and it creates, um, it creates a problem with um, the board's fiduciary obligations, our Charlestown boot problem. Um, OK, so one of the questions that comes up, and it's not clear from the opinion, is whether or not the note holders really understood this conflict. Right? Even though these are protections for the note holders, did they understand that their agreement that the board could waive these provisions really uh, at, at, at a moment when they most needed them, right? The note holders might most want these protections. At that point in time, the board could waive the provisions to benefit the shareholders. Did they understand that that risk was there? Um, on the one hand, until the waiver takes place, it looks like the notes were trading at a fairly even value, at, at, the mark, at, the, at the par value, $47.50. It only drops after the waiver takes place. So it suggests they may not have fully understood this. In other words, the disclosure they were given, right, assuming that there was probably a prospectus or some other offering document, did not highlight this risk. And so perhaps the note holders, when they accepted the notes, didn't fully appreciate the nature of the conflict. Um, okay, so we've got our board of directors at Revlon in this conflict of interest situation. They have the authority to move provisions that protect the note holders, but again, they will do so at a time uh, when they are um, benefiting the shareholders. Um, September 16th rolls around. Pantry Pride uh, agrees to offer up to, uh, to buy up to 90% of Revlon. Right, so it's a subsequent offer now. And they agreed to buy up to 90% of Revlon for $42 a share. Hold on. Didn't they just offer $47.50 like two weeks ago? Three weeks ago? Right, wasn't that the price? And now they're coming back and saying, well, 
OK, guess what? For you, $42. Can they do this? What's going on here? How can they do this? Lazard says that the 4750 and the 42 are actually the same. Well, I'm sorry, if a banker doesn't know that 47 and a half is higher than 42, I, I, maybe not a banker. So what, how can they say this? How can these be substantially the same? What has happened between the 4750 and the 42? The defenses. And what defenses in particular? The notes, the debt. Okay? So when we talk about the debt having a negative value for the equity, you're seeing it right here. Right? The debt being a defense because it lowers the price of the company, the value of the company for the equity holders, you're seeing it here. This is a great example of it. So Pantry Part is saying, we offered $47.50. You've now increased the debt by the issuance of all these notes. The value to us is less as a shareholder. You've sucked up all that extra cash. You've gotten rid of the discretionary funding that added value to the company. So now we're not going to offer you the original 4750. You now have leveraged the company. We're only going to offer you $42. And again, this is on page 12, um, 1283, I guess, right? Yeah, 1293. Sorry, 1293. Uh, Lazard advises Revlon that the price is roughly the same. Now, in the process, Pantry Pride ultimately does increase the price, again, up to $58. So they increase it to $50 then to $53. At some point in this process, the Revlon board begins to say, look, we better find a white knight. Right, so the price is going higher and higher, and the Revlon board decides they have to find somebody else. Um, could Revlon have simply said no to Pantry Pride, just said, look, we're just not going to talk to you anymore? Can they just say no? Well, can they just say no? What did Airgas tell us? The Airgas board just said no. Uh, it doesn't just like, say no, it does delay. Uh, okay, well, but just say no means I'm not going to negotiate with you. Eventually you might be able to vote me out, but I'm not going to talk to you. Or I'm not going to talk to you. Yeah, I mean, Brevlon could have just said go away. Right? We have our defenses in place. So long as they satisfy Unical, and the court thought at this point Unical had been satisfied, just go away. We're, not gonna, we're just going to do nothing now. Right? We, we don't have to talk to you. If you don't like it, so vote us out. Well, why do you say that? Well, how do you know that? How do you know that? How? How can you tell me that it's not undervalued? Don't let me. How can, how can you, are, you, are, you, are you better than Lazard at this? Better than the board of Revlon? How can you say, how can you say it's under, not undervalued? 47, 42, 4750 undervalued. Yeah. So it's 50, 53. So, okay, so what's, how can you say it's no longer a threat? How can you say it's under, no longer undervalued? Because the, uh, the board. Okay. Does that mean it's undervalued? I can negotiate. I could, they, I could have authorized you to negotiate at a lower price. Okay. 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 Great answer, right? So what happens here is the Revlon board says at some level, 50-53, it's inevitable this company is going to be taken over. Right? If we say just no, go away, we're going to have unhappy shareholders who may vote us out. It's going to be very difficult for us to defend against this price. So it's inevitable. So at the time the board authorizes uh, Revlon's management to find a white knight, it's a signal. The company has given up. It's going to be sold to somebody at the price level, $53, at which uh, Pantry Pride is now looking to buy this company. Uh, the board of directors could just say no, but then they're going to have angry shareholders, perhaps running to the media, complaining to the news, eventually voting them out, perhaps a proxy fight uh, with Mr. Perlman. Um, and so at that stage, because it looks inevitable that they're going to be sold, they authorize senior managers to find a white knight. Uh, and at that stage, it looks as if the board of directors has accepted 
that they will be taken over. So that seems to indicate that yes, the threat has gone away. They've hit a price that they think they're going to be acquired. They now want to manage who's going to acquire them. Um, okay, so at this point, we move from the company as a defender to the company as now a maximizer, the board of directors as a maximizer of value. So we're going to shift from Unical to what are now referred to as Revlon duties. And we'll pick up on those next week. Now, when you look at Revlon duties, if you've not yet had a chance, read them using your Unical model. So Unical says, the board of directors, good faith, reasonable, must assess the nature of the threat, and the response must be reasonable and proportionate. Revlon says, the board of directors must assess, good faith, reasonable, the nature of the competing bids, and then based upon these bids, respond accordingly. And in this case, they find that the bids do not clearly favor Perlman or Forsman, and so the response is disproportionate because it ends up favoring Forsman over Perlman. But it's a unical analysis applied in this case to an, option, uh, an auction construct. But it's the same. Reasonableness, good faith on the one hand, to assess the nature of the threat in Unical, to assess the nature of the competing bids in Revlon, a response that is proportionate to the threat in Unical, and a response that reflects the nature of the competing bids, whether one is better than the other in the Revlon case. Okay, so we'll pick up Revlon next week. Uh, I look forward to seeing you then. Thanks very much.